<laughs> she wants the host. Of course. <laughs> Okay, so I guess, Leroy, do you want me? I'll just introduce again our team. Again, you guys all know me, Joni Kidder. And with me is my deputy who's desperately trying to log in, Waskar Robles. Um, and tonight is with me our executive director of BQE Design, Build, and Emergency Contracts, Tammy Pandia. And on her team, Sally Stolberg, uh, who's also an engineer on Tanvi's team. Uh, Tanvi will take you through the presentation and we'll do Q&A and give you as much information as we have. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you. That was awesome. So uh, my name is Anthony Marino. I'm the uh, committee chair for the traffic and transportation. Um, we are here tonight with uh, members of DOT. Uh, and with that introduction, I turn it over to you, Tanvi. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me see if I can share screen. Okay, everybody see my screen? Yep. Yes. All right, here we go. Okay, so um, thank you all for making time for us tonight. We wanted to make sure that we got to as many people as possible uh, early <coughs> so that people can plan. This is specifically for the interim repairs and the closures that are associated with that that's coming up in 2023. Um, so as some of you may be aware, the larger conversation on the long-term plan for BQE has started, but that's, that's a separate group of and meetings where we are discussing that in much more detail, and hopefully all of you are participating and involved. Um, but for tonight, we're focusing purely on these upcoming interim repairs. Um, so the work that is involved, we'll walk through that. Um, exactly why it's necessary, why we're doing this right now, even though the longer term plan is under uh, discussion, what that means for the weekend closures and the detour efforts, and then we'll be available for any questions that you have. So this section of the BQE, as we've discussed before, the cantilever is what we're talking about. And as we can see on the map, this being the only highway in this area, anytime we do closures, it has regional implications and certainly implications throughout Brooklyn. Um, so, you know, while we're coming to you now about these specific repairs, you know that we've been working on this structure for a while. Um, we have been doing in-depth inspections. Um, we had done some, uh, you know, state has to do inspections every two years of every bridge structure. So that happens uh, regularly on all bridges throughout the city. But in addition to that, we made it a point for this structure because of its condition to go out on a quarterly basis. And we're there with our engineers to check on things. Um, and then anytime obviously something is flagged, we do additional efforts in the um, testing or whatever is necessary. We have also installed sensors throughout the length of the, the structure in various places to give us data. And um, this tells us you know, how to analyze the structure to get a sense of what's going on. Um, as you might have heard, since 2019, we've had a WIM sensor, which is a weigh in motion sensor installed in the roadbed that tells us the weights of the trucks as they're going over it. Uh, no surprise to anyone, I'm sure, a lot mm -hmm. of them are overweight. This is of concern, you know, just because of the condition of the structure, but also overall in the city. Um, and so one of the things we were able to do through this program is to alert uh, a lot of the decision makers on the need to be able to truly enforce the weight limits on the structure using automated uh, methods similar to what we do with the speed program. And so that was a legislation that was signed at the end of last year. We're in the midst of installing this, the whole system that goes with automated enforcement currently. Uh, and early 2023, some of the enforcement efforts will begin. Um, all of this data that we're getting, the weights of the trucks, the sensors, what they tell us, um, and the in-person visits all feed into an electronic you know, model that we have, um, which we work with Rutgers, C2 Smart, uh, which are experts in a lot of these things. And we analyze the model to say, okay, what do we need to do in near term? What are the actions we need to take for longer term? And so on. So that's where some of the work that we've just identified came out of. All of this analysis identified a couple of locations that we wanted to address in the near term. 
So that's that's sort of the background on how we arrived at what we need to do. So the locations that were identified are these two spans on the Queensbound Roadway, uh, roughly at Grace Court and Clark Street. So it, this is, these are both decks, um, portions of decks on the Queensbound direction. And also, um, if, when you're driving on Furman Street, you can see there's that grading and, and some uh, MTA facilities that's embedded inside the BQE, rough, uh, that's also at Clark Street. So there's a portion of that TA facility that's in case, I will show you some pictures in a moment, that needs attention as well. So we'll take care of that, as well as some work that needs to be done on the support structure of the BQE that's inside the Geralman garage. Um, so like if you're coming down Geralman towards Furman on the left-hand side, there are these rolling doors. Um, and so within there are supports to the BQE structure that we need to address. So looking at it from another angle, these are two sections of the decks that we need to address roughly at Clark Street and at Grace Court. Um, so promenade is not affected and Staten Island bound while it doesn't have any work on it has some traffic implications to it. So the section that I was talking about that's inside Clark Street is sort of sandwiched between the Queens bound roadway and the uh, Staten Island bound roadway, and it really doesn't have a good access. The only way to get into this area, right? So this is behind this wall as you're going to Staten Island bound on your left, the big wall that you see. Behind there is this chamber that you see on the bottom left. Um, and that has seen some deterioration over the years. The only way to access it is from the Queens bound deck. There's a manhole and you have to climb down from there. So it makes it very difficult for anybody to get in and out and do the work. So what we've done is we work with MTA um, to make sure that we, we can address this condition while the deck work is happening up top and um, there's roadway closure already in place. Um, so there's no implication to a subway system with this. This is just something we need to do to address like this column where there's a lot of the concrete has come off and some other areas like that. Um, and similar with support structure that gets uh, deterioration over the years, this is the, the area inside Geralman structure that I was talking about. So if you go through these roll up doors way back into that cavernous area, oops, um, are these concrete beams that have seen uh, deterioration and some of the concrete needs to be repaired. Um, and also this abutment in the back, which is the substructure unit also needs work. So that can happen without any implication to BQE traffic. Um, the only people who would really notice that this work going on is when, if you're right on Geralman, you might see traffic coming in and out of, of the garage. But other than that, there's no major implication um, for this work. So really the, the bigger conversation piece for today is this work that's happening on Queensbound Roadway. And I just want to take a moment to kind of explain why we need to do what we need to do and why it is it has to be done in this specific way, because um, on the surface, it, you know, I'm sure you've driven by where you've seen certain repairs happening in a lane by lane configuration. And why in this case, we're talking about all lanes being implied. So just uh, need a moment to explain that. So as you're driving on Queensbound Roadway or Staten Island Roadway, I'm sure you've seen those mesh, the, uh, the steel mesh every 50 feet or so. Those are the joints in the decks as you go by. When those joints leak, that's that area of concrete directly adjacent to it is where you see the most deterioration. And so we need to address those areas. Um, and, and we're addressing only a couple of them because they are the ones actually affecting the potential load carrying capacity down the line in two, three years. So this is not a uh, imminent concern, is that we see that if this level of deterioration continues at these two locations, we would get to a point where it wouldn't be able to carry, that section wouldn't be able to carry the trucks that are on the roadway. So instead of having to kick the, uh, the trucks down the line off the BQE, we were, we're taking care of those conditions now and sort of arresting these, this deterioration. So the, if you see that, you see even from underneath, you see the, the concrete you know, is kind of pebbly and it looks like it needs to come out. 
So we would do that directly adjacent to the joint would be in that cantilever section would be substantial amount of concrete has to come out. A lot of it is already off, to be honest. And then there's rebar inside that has deteriorated. So we might need to add new rebar, clean it up and then place new concrete. Because of the way this structure is, all three lanes need to have the concrete placed at the same time. We need to let it cure and then open up the traffic. Otherwise it won't work. So that's why we have to do this work in this way where we go across all three lanes or two lanes, depending on which section you're in. Um, and then as, so basically we remove the bad concrete at the top, place new concrete, place additional rebar if you've lost too much of the rebar being those steel sections that you see. If, if a lot of it has deteriorated, we need to replace or add new ones. While we're doing that at the deck, we'll use the opportunity for the crew to get down into this area underneath, which is in this corner here. And they will, that will be a separate crew that will be doing work. And, and then there'll be crew working up top. So the way this would work is there's a lot of prep that has to go on, right? So before we can put in new concrete, we have to remove all of the deteriorated concrete first. Because if you put new concrete over bad concrete, it all yeah. just pops out, it doesn't work. So what would happen is there would be several nights of removal of bad concrete during the overnight hours, the typical hours that we have from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m., right? So it's very limited time that we go down to one lane. The, the lane that's closed um, is where they would work. They would put plates back in the morning, open up the traffic, come back at night, remove the plate, continue removing this bad concrete. So this is only for the first couple of feet on either side of the joint, which is really poor condition concrete. So that in this cantilever section, so in this section that hangs out over Staten Island bound, all of that bad concrete needs to come out. And so when they're doing that removal, we may have to close this one lane also just to protect the traveling public, yeah. even though the work will be done from the top. And then flip, we, the traffic is on the outside. We remove this other um, deteriorated concrete on the inside lane. So this would be several nights of overnight work to, to prepare. Once that preparation is done, then there will be the first weekend closure. And I'll, I'll explain how these weekends would work in a moment. Um, but once that prep is done for that first set of uh, uh, first trip adjacent to the joint, from 2 a.m. Saturday to Monday, 4 a.m. would be the complete closure of Queensbound Roadway with one lane open on Staten Island bound. So the reason it has to be done this way is we have to place the concrete across all three lanes and the cantilever portion, since we're placing concrete in, okay. Um, because we're placing concrete in this section, uh, it needs support. Wet concrete doesn't hold itself really well. You have to uh, support it. So while it's uh, curing, we need to have a support. Once that concrete is set a little bit, we can remove that lower, um, you know, lower support. And then just the queen's bound will be allowed to continue to set a little bit longer and then open it up for Monday morning. So that's the first weekend. The subsequent weekends, um, would be just Queensbound roadway closure. So there would be overnight closures to do the next trip in from the joint. So the first weekend is the two to three feet from the joint. Then the next trip um, happens the second weekend and then the third weekend. So both deck sections would be worked at uh, together. So all you know, there will be two sections of the roadway that are being worked on, two sets of crew, and then they would be preparing. So then there would be a second and third weekend where there would be Saturday night to Monday morning closure um, to, to place the concrete. But um, that's, I'll, I'll, I'll explain how these weekends would be spread out because obviously living in the city, we never get to have three weekends back to back of nothing going on. So the first weekend, once they get the prep done, they do that closure, then they continue prep with overnight closures then comes a second weekend. And then again, prep work overnight and then a third weekend. 
So in um, so there would be three weekends of Queens bound closure and one weekend where there's also a Staten Island bound lane that's closed. Throughout this time, obviously we have to, for those closures to actually work, we need to do a regional detour. It can't be that we detour directly right at this section, right? So we've been in contact with uh, New Jersey Turnpike and New York State and MTA and TBTA and Port Authority and everybody, right? To make sure that not only they don't do any work the same time that we're doing it, but that they're also getting the word out um, using their VMS signs and everything and alerting drivers to stay away from this area completely, right? So anybody that can take an alternate route completely out of this regional uh, corridor, we want to do that. Secondly, getting out to talking to all of you all throughout all uh, Brooklyn and a lot of the, the freight industry and businesses to make sure that they try to work around this weekend to the extent possible so that we reduce some of that local traffic, whatever degree that that's possible. But regardless, there will obviously be traffic implications. Um, even, even if we do get the word out and most people do heed the warning and take mass transit or other routes, uh, we will need TA agents and pedestrian managers to make sure that this goes as smoothly as possible and we at least make sure that everything is safe. Um, the VMS signs that, you know, we'll obviously put VMS signs all over the place, those, those portable signs, but we'll also use the overhead signs that are throughout the region to keep alerting the, the drivers ahead of the closures and then throughout the closure to, to sort of say, you know, here's what the delays are, use alternate route, go somewhere else. We'll be in touch with the WASI and other app-based routing uh, people to say, hey, listen, we only want people to use the designated detour route. If you don't send them down these other little streets that are not meant to take this kind of traffic. So we're working towards all that. We're also working with New York State, DOT, and uh, the MTA to make sure that Prospect Expressway is set up to act as an HOV like it is normally in the AM to encourage people to take the tunnel into lower Manhattan instead of coming up towards Brooklyn and Manhattan, to, uh, reduce that load up there. Um, so all of this coordination is ongoing. We've met with uh, PD, uh, emergency services, where, you know, to make sure that they're stationed in good places to make sure they can get to where they need to get to. So there's, there's a lot of conversation going on um, and it's been going on for several months already. Um, so one of the things also I want to make sure that we touch on is obviously these three weekends are not back to back. Um, we have to take into account all the different holidays and, and, you know, various events that happen throughout the city when you can't have something like this going on, right? So uh, the bike tour or the major holidays and all of those are crossed off, right? So when we put this contract out, we already crossed off all of those major holidays um, we also got in touch with, you know, Brooklyn Bridge Park, make sure that we are coordinating their calendar so we don't end up with an event um, adjacent to all of this going on and, and so on. There's many, many conflicts. So what ends up happening is you essentially get a weekend, let's say in May, right? Mid-May, we get a weekend that's clear of all this interference. So the contractor does all the prep work leading up to that weekend. Now, the next weekend that's available, let's say it happens to be middle of August, so then you may not see a lot of activity in between because there's no sense in having plates sitting out there unnecessarily for too long. So what happens is they might do other work that's down below at Jeralman or whatever. As that second weekend in August comes closure, prior to that one is when they will start doing the prep again during the overnight hours so that they're ready for that second weekend. And then a third weekend may not happen till, I don't know, middle of September or whatever it is, right? So. These weekends will be spread out throughout the construction season as best as we can fit around all of the events that happen in the city. So um, obviously there will be significant amount of press around it to make sure as many people as possible are alerted, encouraging people to take alternate modes of transportation. Um, tons of TA agents were working with PD to also like help us enforce some of the things that we try to do in addition to having the TEA agents there. 
uh, pet managers at specific intersections, especially when you're very close to some of the parks, uh, signage, um, and then there will be some local lane configurations that we have to um, change also for those weekends to work. So, you know, we know certain left turns tend to lock up intersections. So we might have to modify that for that weekend and there'll be signs well in advance for that. Um, like I said, we would have emergency services and PD coordination and have them stationed in certain locations. Um, we've talked about having them uh, also say, uh, kind of staged at Brooklyn Bridge Park to make sure if something happens to someone in the park, there's quick access. Um, for those who are closer to the, the site itself, there will be noise mitigation, sound blankets that absorb the sound rather than just bounce it around. Um, and there would be monitoring of that and the dust mitigation and so on. So um, before I get into all, all of this, I just also wanna let you know that we are gathering input as I lay out these detours, um, how we thought we could do this. Just wanna let you know, we did a pretty extensive traffic modeling. Um, we had a model when we were thinking about the larger project. So we deployed that to test out what works, doesn't work. We've been collecting information. We have gotten some input from a few of the other communities that we are going to be absorbing into our detour plan. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, if you want me to hold for questions till later or if, if cause I see a raised hand, I don't know if you wanna take it now. Uh, yo, uh, Dean, you have a question? We can, yeah, if you don't mind, we can maybe take a second for a few questions. Yeah. Can I just ask you, just repeat your name for us so we can just make the notes? Sure. It's Dean Rossini. Thank you. I'm a member of the committee. Um, being it seems we're go, uh, if we have some police presence and fire department, are you allocating any overtime money to ensure that we have those resources available? Um, so we coordinate with the through the city hall on some of these things. We understand, you know, so when we allocate the TE agents, that's part of our budget. We have to work that out. Um, the, any additional efforts, we obviously have to work with city hall and figure out any issues that come up with that. Uh, I can't speak specifically to the budget, but we do work that out with uh, at the highest level to make sure we have the coverage we need. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so this is uh, this slide is specifically to that first weekend when we have Staten Island bound down to one lane. So instead, uh, so between Tillery and Atlantic roughly is where we are dropping that lane, right? So we don't want to add traffic from those local exits at that point. This way, just the through traffic continues. So anybody that started in Queens on BQE stays on. But anybody that would have got on from the Dumbo area would use the detour routes. So that's general um, setup for this. So either they're coming up Furman or one of the other uh, setups that we have. And in the meantime, Prospect is set up as HOV going towards the, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. Um, there are some local implications, which you know, there's a oh, wow. bus stop oh. and so on, but. For those who would have got on at Tillery, those would be diverted to Third Avenue. And then the ones who would come off Bro uh, Manhattan Bridge or from that local area would be sent down Fourth Avenue. Now, obviously this adds to an already congested roadway. So this is why we're doing two things, right? One is making sure there are TA agents throughout this corridor for this to work, but also, um, we're, we're making sure that we only send limited traffic through here. So, you know, trying to divert and disperse traffic well in advance. So people don't come all the way to the exit and then come here. Um, the rest of the people that come off Brooklyn Bridge who tend to take that Wine Street on ramp would be diverted down to Furman Street and then they can come back on to BQE at Columbia Street. And in order to make that work, we're also gonna be modifying that Columbia Street on-ramp at Atlantic. So these will be the three prime, uh, you know, marked detour plans for that weekend. So one lane in Staten Island bound direction is open, but for those who would have added on to BQE down at the Dumbo area, those are the ones who would be detoured to these three primary areas. Um, 
So just to kind of dig in closer on this, um, when, when this lane is closed, you know, typically at this Columbia Street, there's only one lane that comes on to that Staten Island bound roadway. For this weekend, we're gonna modify it so that two lanes can come on so that the traffic keeps flowing through Furman. And so to make that work, Furman Street will be one direction only. So the northbound will be closed for that one weekend. It'll be two lanes coming south on Furman so that then two can turn on to Columbia Street and continue on um, for those who are headed to BQA. Um, so again, to make this work, there's some you know, local street implications, which we'll get into much more details as we get closer. But like I said, there will be certain parking uh, rules that we might have to take away for that weekend. There will be signage and you know distribution on that. On the Queensbound direction, obviously, this is a little bit bigger lift because we're closing it in its entirety. So this on ramp onto BQE from uh, Prospect, or sorry, from Fourth Avenue onto BQE would be closed. Prospect is open, um, and then the other on ramp at Gowanus would also be closed because there's no sense in having people add on at uh, onto BQE and then have everybody dump out at Atlantic. So we're trying to control that and have them detour ahead of time and avoid the area to the extent possible. Um, so this, this will also mean that some of the local streets have to be modified because um, they need to be able to get through not onto the on-ramp, but down to Tillery to get back onto BQE. Um, so there'll be some left turns that are banned in certain areas that tend to lock up the intersection. Um, Atlantic obviously becomes a major detour for that weekend. So everybody that stayed on to BQE um, will all have to get off at Atlantic and then use Borum and get back on at Tillery or Sands. Um, those who are coming from further out um, at Third Avenue will be detouring, uh, you know, telling them to stay on Third and continue straight, don't get on to BQE. Um, and then similarly, uh, so these will be the mapped detour routes for that. So Atlantic and uh, Third Avenue. So again, this, this would be the, the locations where we would have T agents, a lot of signage, um, you know, turn modifications if needed, but most definitely uh, T agents. The one other area that we would need to think about is there are some people who are headed towards Linden Boulevard or who would have headed into the airports. Those few, and we've actually done the deep dive on how many those are, uh, are it's not a big number on weekends. During a weekday, certainly there would be a lot, but we're talking about only specifically on a weekend. There are some, and so if those can just stay out of this area and head towards uh, Linden Boulevard, then that's a better option for the weekend. But again, this is not significant number. Um, for all of this to work in Brooklyn, obviously those who did take the Manhattan Bridge have to be able to get off and keep things moving. If that end locks up, then everybody backs into Brooklyn. So we're also doing some modifications on Manhattan side, a um, couple of DA agents on that side as well to keep things flowing so that as traffic wants to exit Manhattan Bridge, they're able to do that. So that's um, some local street grid changes to make that work. Where we are in all this is we finished the plans. Um, we have put the contract out to bid. Uh, once that contractor is selected, we have some you know, process to go through to, to get to an award and finalize the bid and so on. We anticipate that happening in 2023 early, uh, first quarter. So what happens, the thing that we'll be asking for this contractor, the first deliverable for them will be to give us a schedule based on their production expectation, how many nights they think they need to do different tasks, they, and we've given them a calendar of the do's and not available weekends, right? So they're gonna look at that calendar and tell us, here are the three weekends we think we want for closures. So as our, quickly as we can formalize that, we will then get back out to the community and say, okay, here are the three weekends we anticipate doing this so that everybody can plan to the extent possible 
to either use a different mode of transportation or, you know, for businesses, a different delivery date or and so on to try to avoid um, adding to the traffic for those three weekends. So early next year, we will be coming back with specific weekend dates so that people can plan. And then um, we'll continue obviously sharing data as it comes up. The first weekend that we do closure and of course also the subsequent, we will have our own forces in addition to the contractors and the PD and so on that will observe conditions at different areas. Um, we also have this thing, uh, the traffic management center where we have access to a ton of cameras plus any information that the field personnel are providing so that they can coordinate. And if something is becoming a problem, alert the appropriate people and say, hey, this intersection is not working or there's a problem here, um, deal with it or whatever. So there'll be a lot of that interactive things going on. If we see something in the first weekend that either did or didn't work well, and we wanna make a change for the second weekend, we certainly can. Um, but all of that input will be ongoing throughout. Um, so again, these are three overnight, uh, there'll be overnight closures during that window in chunks as the weekends come up. The three weekends will be spread out over that March to October of 2023. German garage repairs can occur at whatever time that suits the contractor's schedule. And then, like I said before, as soon as we have a more specific schedule, we'll be back in touch with everyone. So that's the, the main uh, presentation. I do wanna take a moment to talk about something that we did hear from the community and that we are um, incorporating into our up approach. Um, and that is this. Um, Okay, so this is specifically related to the, the closure down at the Fifth Street area and McDonald Avenue. Um, when we went out to the community boards down that way, and in fact, even before that, we heard that this is a very problematic intersection, mm -hmm. even under the best of circumstances. And so um, using, even if it's limited amount of traffic that might head that way because they're trying to get to Linden Boulevard, we shouldn't consider that uh, the way we had it. So we had, if you, and it's a little confusing sometimes because if you look at the marked uh, freight plan, it doesn't, a uh, freight route, it doesn't quite identify this, but this is actually a state route. And so therefore it's automatically a freight route. Uh, but what we heard from the community is that their preference would be to have McDonald Avenue be the, the detour route rather than Fifth Street. And so we are reviewing that. And you know, unless we hear something from someone else that says, no, no, there is an issue with it, uh, most likely that's the way we'll move forward with it. So this is just the detail. Um, and the concern being that as, as traffic comes down here, this is a, a you know, heavily pedestrian area. So that's not the best place to send them. So we can send them down McDonald's and then down to Caton and so on. So that's again for that um, for the weekend. So um, we had multiple T agents planned here anyway. So it's just a matter of where we move them around um, to make sure that this works. So I just wanted to say that ahead of time because we've heard about this from quite a few community members. And with that, I can take questions. Thank you so much. That was that was incredibly detailed, and I <laughs> that's wow. There's a lot happening. Um, does anybody have any questions? I do. Go for it, Josephine. I was looking for my hand raising. <laughs> That's okay. You can just raise um, your hand. So my, my first question is, um, do you have a sense of, um, you, you mentioned that there'll be enough time. Do you know what the advanced timing will be? Will it be a month in advance, you know, you know, a few weeks in advance of notification of the weekend closures? Because I, I do agree, mm -hmm. I think, you know, um, I found from from working as DM, the the more advanced notice, the better, and and continual updates. Um, but I was just curious if you had a sense of of how much lead time you'll you'll be able to have. I would say very easily a month, just because it just takes contractors a little bit to get going. And so as soon as we are confirmed on who the contractor is, we're, we'll be kind of working behind the scenes to get them to start planning. 
Um, but once that official notice goes out to the contractor that you can start, it usually takes them a few weeks to get totally geared up. So the field activities always lag a little bit, but we can be having conversations with them ahead of time. So I, I could say pretty sure a month is a given. We wouldn't want to push it too far, but a lot is going to depend on how quickly we can get them on board because we wouldn't start in winter. We have to wait for warmer right. months. So depending on exactly when they come on board, but I would say four weeks is pretty darn likely to be the date. That's good. Okay, great. And yeah. Josephine, just to, just to add to what Tanvi's saying, <clears throat> during the weekends, this has come up on a couple of our conversations as well. During the weekends, there actually will be real-time updates on changes that have to be made. Um, as Tanvi said a couple of times, if the traffic agents need to be moved because we've got a condition at a particular location, their supervisors will be in concert with, with her team out in the field on all of those different shifts and we'll be able to broadcast some real-time updates and changes and things. And there will be community outreach staff out in the field during each one of the phases of work as well. So you'll get stuff a month in advance and then you'll get stuff more traditional type that you get seven days in advance from from us and then we'll have people doing real time updates as well and you know the radio and social media new york one everybody's going to be pushing this out great thank you uh, dean yeah do you plan on using the local uh, media the local papers to yes. advertise the three major weekends of closure yes of course Thank you. As much as as much space as they'll give us, yeah, I think everybody's going to jump on it. I would imagine, Dean, it would also be a huge story <laughs> that it's going to be on uh, every morning update. Uh, Steve, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the uh, presentation. I think it was very well handled. Um, I'm just uh, a little bit confused here. Is, is this a, a permanent solution, or is there going to be something further after this, uh, as far as uh, addressing the traffic issues? Because uh, I look at it and I see, uh, you know, just immense amount of traffic. It's like the the, the the expressway there cannot handle the traffic. So, uh, is there something f uh, further coming in the future, or uh, I'm I'm just a little bit yeah. confused as to why we're not doing that, right? If this is just a patch job, in other words. Um, yeah. So actually, we kicked off earlier this. Uh towards the end of the summer, I guess, the larger conversation around what to do with BQE, um, not just at Atlantic to Sands, but also there's conversations on what should happen to North and South. Now, given city only owns Atlantic to Sands portion of the BQE, the sections North and South of the highway itself is owned by the state, but we're working towards uh, uh, laying out a plan. There's been public outreach. There's been a uh, couple of workshops um, we, uh, and Sally can put the link to the website uh, in the chat. Yeah, so there is yeah. a, there's sort of a parallel effort going on. This is just to address the conditions we see as an issue in the near term. And then the larger conversation is happening. Um, and in fact, we have a workshop coming up in a week or so to talk specifically about what we can do for the long run for, for this section of BQE. So, there's sort of a two, two track process here. Um, in terms of the traffic specific to BQE itself, that's part of the you know, BQE conversation, but there's also efforts underway to address the more localized traffic concerns. Um, if I understood correctly, our traffic management plan, uh, group is working on something for uh, Third Avenue, Fourth Avenue, that area of just like managing traffic. There's also a whole separate effort ongoing for freight and how to wean ourselves off of so many trucks and what alternate methods we can use. So there's there's multiple efforts ongoing on uh, with regard to the traffic. It, well, viewing it as a, as a as a temporary uh, patch, okay. Um, how long can this temporary patch last? Uh, because it just seems to me that every time I turn around, I hear another plan for the for the be and, and if this goes on for another five years, are we going to have to do this again in five years, or four years, or two years? How long does this last? That's a really good question, and that's actually something that we're constantly talking through. So um, the earlier slides, I was saying we continuously collect data of, of the structure right. and we keep analyzing. 
So right now, what we've identified is these two spans need to be addressed in the near term of two to three years. If, like you said, uh, if the longer term conversation keeps being pushed out, um, right, right. the structure is sort of like each 50 foot section. It's like we've been calling it like a piano key. So these three or these two piano keys need work right now. But if we don't do anything, there'll be other piano keys that will need work. So we can fix these two. These, these two will now last for th uh, maybe 15, 20 years. But there are others that we're not touching right now, which would become overdue at some point. So what we've been trying to uh, do, and we've, we hopefully can keep that conversation on the larger contract and the larger longer term plan moving at a very quick pace. And that's what the administration has been really pushing is that we cannot just keep kicking this down the line. We need to just come with a solution that we can all get behind with public input, with transparency, so that we don't have to do these piecemeal repairs. We just do one project and, and be done yes. with it. I, I, I personally would uh, like to encourage that because in addition to being a pain in the neck, it's dangerous. And uh, you know that, and I know that, and everybody knows it. So we, it, right. it's the kind of thing, it just seems like it's been consistently pushed down the, the line. I'm very happy that the city is now looking at it and I appreciate what you're talking about. But I, I think that's something that in accepting and, and saying thank you uh, for your presentation, I think that the community board should also be saying, hey, we got to move this, you know, like on, on, the, on the macro scale, not on the uh, micro scale. Tammy, Definitely. I just want to point out, I put the um, BQE vision, that larger corridor project, the events calendar is in the chat. Um, our next meeting is December 13th in person, and that focuses on the BQE Central. There's also one on December 15th on Zoom, if that's easier for people, so you can register for that link. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Doris. Um, yes, overweight trucks are a major concern, and um, I think it's very good you have sensors there. However, we need them at points of origin. We need them before they get on the Verrazano Bridge. We need them before they get on the um, barges to uh, the freight barges to the Bay Ridge Rail Yards and at Kennedy Airport, where huge tractor trailers come in and go through local streets and then on then onto highways where they're overweight. So you really, I really believe it will help everyone if there's more work on that. And other states are more proactive, uh, harsher on overweight trucks with serious fines. I, I completely appreciate what you're saying. One of the challenges of New York City in particular, or any other major city, is that, you know, A, first of all, we're the lower form of government compared to state. So the rulemaking is a little bit, you know, convoluted, but also like we just don't have anywhere to pull over trucks, right? So we've had ongoing PD coverage of this section because we're particularly concerned about this portion of BQE, but they can only pull over so many trucks on a regular basis. And every week we're ticketing, you know, tens of trucks, but PD is stretched in. They can't be in all of these places. So this technology and this legislation that we have obtained um, is going to be a is is actually the first in nation, and if we are able to demonstrate it successfully, I think there will be many more installations that will occur, um, and it actually evens out the playing field, right? Like those who are playing by the rules are sort of losing out to the people who are going overweight. So it's not like we're trying to do anything that is hurting anyone. We're just trying to uh, use the rules that exist and treat everyone the same. And so there's a lot of interest from other uh, folks at Port Authority, at TBTA, to see how well this works and then see if they could put it on their facilities. So like you said, we sort of have a ring around the city so people don't even come into the city that are overweight. And I, I don't know what the 